we'll go ahead and get started. And thank you, John, for, for starting with that. I told him that that was going to be my primary verse. And so uh, that was a, a great place to start with uh, us reading that chapter. So when we look at this, it seems as though that Paul is laying out some kind of well-known formula. Uh, that's a, a possibility here that when he's talking to them about love and the importance of it, He's giving the iteration of faith, hope, and love, and then putting love at the end as though he's emphasizing it, which seems to be some kind of indication that these three things, faith, hope, and love, were a well-known tradition or trice in the Christian church. And that suggests that this is something that they considered core to Christianity. And it seems as though as well, when we're looking at this idea of faith, hope, and love, that these are three primary virtues at the center of everything regarding Christianity. And so because of that, that's going to be the topic of discussion for us this morning. So I want us to kind of go through this entire study, both this week and the, the next two weeks, with three questions in our minds. Uh, you don't have to have them at the forefront of everything, but just kind of keep them in the back of your head as we're going through this. Uh, first of all, why are faith, hope, and love the primary virtues? What is it about these three things that sort of rest at the core of all of Christianity? What is the significance of each virtue singularly and as a group? So this is something that we're going to be thinking about and uh, as, covering as we go through these studies is what is the significance of each of these three things? And we're going to give each one a week and then also think about why these three things together collectively, why they are the three virtues. And then finally, and I think that this is the most important part because it's how we apply them. How do we cultivate these virtues in ourselves and others? What can we do and what advice is this going to be from, from the Bible that we can use to increase the measure of faith, the measure of hope, and the measure of love that is both within us and in our brothers and sisters around us, and, and maybe even an influence in our community beyond the four walls of the church. What do we do to try to encourage these in others and also increase them in ourselves? So we'll go ahead and uh, I actually have the, uh, <laughs> the verse wrong. I don't know how that happened. Uh, so that's uh, Matthew sixteen thirteen through 16. Uh, now, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, what do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. He said to them, but who do you, uh, who do you yourselves say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So what this is an indication of is that there's a formula that is applied here. So we're actually not looking at this verse today for the theology contained within it, although that is absolutely a confession of faith. There's no question that this is a testament to the kind of faith that Peter had. We're actually right now just looking at it more for the formulaic uh, idea that is presented here. So there is something significant about having an understanding of what, who we are and what we believe and what the world around us believes. And so it's interesting that Jesus here is asking Peter, he's saying, so who does everybody else say that I am? And I think that there's a number of different reasons why that may be the case. I think for one, since he knows that the disciples are going to be charged with going out and telling people who he is, he wants them to have some level of situational awareness for what is about to happen. They need to be aware of what the world thinks of Christ before they go out and tell them who he is. And so having that foreknowledge is going to help them undo some of the misinformation that they're going to have to preach against in order to preach the truth. And so in the same way, I think that we can kind of ask the same question, the same formula here uh, that Jesus uses in regards to some theological principles, and I thought that this would be a good place to start for us today when it comes to faith. So uh, I'll just go ahead and open the floor to you. What do people say faith is? When you, when you see a person outside the church, a non-religious person, what would they say faith is? 
Okay, a feeling. That would be uh, one of the things that they could suggest about it, that it's, that it's just sort of a, uh, uh, an emotion that lives within you rather than some kind of conviction. Any, anybody else have anything? Okay, a mental exercise. So that'd kind of be the opposite of what John was just talking about, but still true, because there are some people that would say that it's, it's some kind of uh, intellectual endeavor, but it's, it's not necessarily something connected to anything deeper than that. What else? Right, so they, they treat faith uh, the way that we use it, and this is not necessarily a bad use of it, but when we ask if you're a person of faith or what your faith is, they, they would use it as a synonym for a religion. Okay, belief in something you cannot see, which to a degree is accurate, and to some degree there's a lot more to it than that. Right, Hebrews 11.1. 1. So uh, some people might give you the actual biblical definition that we get from Hebrews 11.1, 1, and we'll look at that in a second. So uh, I think that that's important to point out too, because there are some people that do have a pretty good idea of faith and could give you a decent explanation of it. So uh, it's not as though every person in the world we would encounter might have something that is incorrect when talking about faith, even if they uh, don't have all the right ideas, they may actually be pretty far along the way. And that's an important thing when talking with people anyway, is that you have to understand there are some people that are further down the road or closer to the truth than others are going to be when you talk to them. So I thought probably the best place to start is where the world would go for information like this, Google. And uh, this was from dictionary.com that I found It's a definition of faith, and uh, they give several different definitions, so I thought real quickly we would just sort of peruse through these. Uh, First, they would say confidence or trust in a person or thing. Belief that is not based on proof. Now that one, to me, is very interesting, and, and we'll go through that one a little bit more later. Belief in God or the doctrines of teachings of religion. So more like the the religion answer we got just a second ago. Uh, Belief in anything. That's an interesting one. Uh, Belief in anything as a code of ethics, standards, or merit. So you could have faith, and I don't think this is necessarily a bad definition, you could have faith just in a system, regardless of whether there's anything to it or whether there's any truth to it. Uh, A system of religious belief, again, kind of like the answer we got earlier. The obligation of loyalty or fidelity to a person, promise, engagement, etc. And then the observance of this obligation, fidelity to one's promise, oath, allegiance. And some of those definitions are okay. Some of them are actually pretty good. Some of them, I would argue, are incorrect. And so we'll look at what the Bible actually has to say about faith. But before we do... Um, these were a couple of the answers I came up with. Typically, it conjures up images of buildings or people praying, various rituals, sort of the religious side of it. Uh, when people say a person of faith, that typically means a person that is devout. So there is uh, some things that, that people might think of. They, they might just think of someone who is truly dedicated to a particular religion. Believing in something without a good reason to. That's one that you're going to hear a lot, unfortunately. It's similar to that dictionary definition that we just heard, uh, believing in something without a good reason, uh, believing in something that they can't see, which there's an aspect of that to faith, but typically people associate that with just believing in something because they want it to be true rather than using good sense, reason, anything else to reach that conclusion. And... Those of uh, our friends in the the Protestant world would probably refer to something as the opposite of works. Now, again, I'm not saying that would be their textbook definition of it, or if you ask them that they would say, well, it's the opposite of works. Probably not. They just think that this is one of the qualities that defines faith, is that it's often juxtaposed against works in their theology. So now I'll open up the floor again. What do you say that faith is? Intentionality to live by a standard. Okay. Yeah, I would definitely say that's an aspect of faith is you have set a standard and you are faithful to that standard that you live intentionally by sort of conforming yourself to that standard. That, that's definitely a, a big aspect of faith. What else? Right. <laughs> um, so a, a faith in God and a, a faithfulness to his word. Assurance. Okay, so that's an interesting one, because 
uh, assurance in the precepts of the scripture, assurance in eternal life, assurance in a number of different things. Basically, knowing something is true, not being on the fence about it or hoping that it's true, but having assurance that it is. So uh, I think every single one of those hit on faith in some way, and, and this is a very broad word, a very broad topic that we could use. So I do want to uh, go really quickly to the definition that, that you gave us just a second ago in Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. Now faith is the certainty, another word for assurance, uh, now faith is the certainty of things hoped for, a proof of things not seen. For by it the people of old gained approval. By faith we understand the world has been created by the word of God, so that what is seen has not been made out of things that are invisible. Now, in any way, does this sound like people that don't have a good reason to believe something? Because this does not sound like a lot of the definitions that we saw that the world would give for faith. It sounds like something that people are pretty sure of. And the word that it uses there is certainty, but then it also uses the word proof. A proof is something that is immutable. You have it, it's there, that settles it. That's what a proof is. And so it's interesting that it uses faith saying that it is a proof of things not seen. In other words, it's not, well, we think that, using inductive reasoning here, there's a good chance that what we're looking at is correct. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that the faith is a certainty, a proof of things that you have not witnessed. And so it's interesting that it puts faith in those terms. Then it goes and talks about people of old, talking about people of the Old Testament. If you've read Hebrews 11, you'll notice that there's a, a long list where it reiterates some of the stories of the Old Testament and talks about how to them it was a certainty, it was a proof of things that they had not yet seen. And then in verse 3, it's interesting to me because there seems to be a cause and effect relationship here. Did you notice that? That where it's saying, by faith we understand that the world has been created by the word of God so that what is seen has not been made out of things that are visible. In other words, it's stretching out this idea of a proof that has been presented. That because we have faith, we understand this thing, and we understand this thing because the thing exists and there is a rational explanation for that. So it's not that we believe something because there is no good reason for it, it's actually talking about the faith right there. So how is it, since we're, we're sort of teasing this out, it's talking about this is how the people of old gained approval, and it's going to list all of those different Bible heroes and their accomplishments and things that they engaged in because of their faith. How did the people of old gain approval through their faith? Right. So there's a relationship, a cause and effect relationship there as well. It does not say, by faith, Noah really believed God existed. It didn't say, by faith, Moses heard the burning bush and was like, oh, okay, I, I guess God's actually out there somewhere. It says, by faith, Noah built an ark. By faith, Moses basically gave up all of the things of life that you could have wanted and instead sought to obey God. And so there's this aspect of each of these stories where their faith influences their behavior, their decisions, their choices. It's not merely a believing in something. It is saying that we know that they were faithful and that they gained approval of God by their faith, specifically because it altered who they were and what they did. And so there's a relationship there that goes a lot deeper than just believing in something. It's saying it's not just that you believe, it's that you believe and you are convicted enough of that belief that you act upon that belief. And so there is an aspect of that contained within Hebrews 11. And I, I do wish we had time to just read through the whole thing. There's a multitude of lessons just in that passage. But if we're going to more keep on the, the idea of just faith and understanding exactly what that is and what it means, uh, we need to move on to Romans 1 because it shows the same kind of cause and effect relationship that we saw at the tail end of Hebrews 1.3. So this verse reads in Romans 1, 17 through 20. 
For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous one will live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived, being understood by what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So it's interesting here that it says that righteousness is not the same as faith, but the two are inextricably linked. Because if you're looking there where it talks about the righteous one is going to be a person that lives by their faith, it's not saying that everyone who is not righteous does not have faith on some level, or maybe what would be more clearly defined as belief. But what it is saying is that a righteous person is not just a person that believes something. A righteous person is somebody that acts upon that belief in a way that accurately reflects that. And so it's contrasting here the righteous people with those who, as we'd see later, later in the chapter, if we were to read further, their God is their bellies. They essentially just go from place to place, acting on a whim, acting on impulse, just reacting to their instincts. That's not an intentional lifestyle. That is not a lifestyle that is marked by someone who deeply believes something. That is marked by somebody who just does whatever comes into their mind at the time. That's not the definition or the understanding of a righteous person or a person of faith that Paul gives us in Romans 1. And it's interesting that at the end of this, we see that people with faith, uh, without faith must, must actually ignore or explain away evidence to do so. Now, normally, when confronted with this issue, it is presented in the opposite direction, isn't it? That if you have faith, you're the one positively acting on something, and if you are a non-righteous person that just lives by their whims and lives by their fancies and, and doesn't believe in the Bible, you're somebody that... Uh, you would need to be thoroughly convinced of something to believe in the Bible. But it's interesting that here in Romans, we kind of see that relationship flipped on his head a little bit, don't we? It's saying that the people who are behaving in a way as though there is no God to hold them accountable are actually acting against common sense, against reason, and against what has been revealed to them, not through scripture or divine revelation, but by the very nature of this world. There is an order that is set in place, there is a way that God has prepared the world in order that it, it basically functions to benefit him and his relationship with humankind. And to act in contradiction to that is actually actively working against the things that instinctively you know. I find that really fascinating that Paul is bringing this up, that you are actually working against your creation. You are working against the way that you were created and things that are both evident with, uh, within you and evident to you, you have to work against that in order not to believe and not to be a person of faith. So in other words, you have to give some kind of excuse as to why you do not fashion your life in such, such a way. Oh, uh, I'm using the New American Standard Version. Yeah, um, and this is the 1995 edition that I'm using. So there is a new one that came out just a couple of years ago, but I'm using the 1995 version. So uh, if you do want to look that up, if you have your Bible app on, then the 1995 version should be in there. So uh, I appreciate that comment, and I, I do certainly think that Paul presents the the basically the overall theme of Romans, if you really dig into it, the reason that he uses that in his introduction is he's going to pit those two things against one another, that the people of faith act in this way and the people without faith are acting in direct contradiction to how they were created. Uh, so in the same sense, I want to share you, with you this quote by Thomas Jefferson, who himself was not one of the more religious founders. He certainly was religious, despite what some historians will tell you, but He's not one of the most religious of the founders, and he kind of bounced around when it came to religion, but he did give this line to his nephew, Peter Carr. He was writing to him about how to think, how to improve himself and improve his education, and he writes this to him, and I think this is a fantastic way to describe faith. 
He says, fix reason firmly in her seat and call to her tribunal every fact, every opinion. Question with boldness even the existence of a God, because if there be one, he must more approve the homage of reason than that of blindfolded fear. Jefferson understood that a faith that is questioned, that is tried, that goes through the ringer, is the strongest faith of all. He was a person of faith. He very clearly believed in God. Uh, he was a religious person. He attended church regularly, all of those things. But he understood that if you truly want to have faith, you can't just blindly believe something and refuse to hear any arguments against it. He says at the first part there, call to her tribunal every fact, every opinion. He says, there should be no challenge that you're unwilling to accept. When it comes your way, you should listen to it, consider it, and then decide on its merits after that. But you shouldn't be somebody that's afraid of questioning. A, a good friend of mine, Jacob Bear, he used to say this and was fond of this saying, he would say, uh, truth doesn't fear any questions. And it's a good point to make because if you have the truth, you're not afraid of any kind of questioning that may come against it because you know that it's going to be the truth regardless of whether it's questioned or not. Uh, there's an old lawyer saying that says, when you have the facts, you talk about the facts. When you have the evidence, you talk about the evidence. And when you have neither of those two things, you just bang the table. Now, you, the point is you're going to argue regardless, but uh, if you know that you have the truth on your side, your job then becomes a lot easier. And that's the point that it's making here. If we're going to be people that truly believe in something, and react in a way it affects our behavior to do so, then we're not going to be afraid of the questions that come before us, and we're not going to be afraid that our common sense is somehow going to run afoul of our faith. And so Jefferson uh, believes this and talks about it with his nephew, saying, don't, don't be afraid to seek out other opinions or things that disagree with you. In fact, that is going to strengthen, not weaken, your faith. And James talks about this a little bit in James 1, 2 through 3, where he says, Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, I think that it's very clear from the context and what we see later in the book of James that he is talking about trials that include things like torture, that includes things like the persecution that he knows that the people he's speaking to are going to endure. But I think that included in that, the testing of your faith also includes things that at least the world would say proves that your faith is not true. And so there's going to be challenges to our faith and James actually says, don't, don't be afraid of those things. Count them as a blessing because it increases your faith. It produces endurance. It produces perseverance. And it also produces a surety, which is what we were talking about earlier. Once you've tried your faith, for those of you, I know we have a mixed audience here. There's some of you that have had faith for a lot longer than me, and some of you that are probably pretty new to this. And for those of you that are younger, if you talk to the people that are older and have been members of the church for a very long time, uh, your faith is going to be tested. That's just part of the deal. Your faith is going to be tested at some point, and you're going to come to a crossroads where you have to answer that question, do I actually believe in this, and do I continue down this path or not? And it's probably going to happen multiple times. And so when that happens, you're either going to do one of two things. You're going to fall away or you're going to strengthen your faith through that process. And if that is the case, then somebody that's been doing it for a very long time, that's probably somebody that's had their, test, their faith tested multiple times and has continued in it. And so that's a, a wealth of uh, information and resource to you for people that have been at the faith for a long time because they've undoubtedly gone through trials at some point in their life and had to endure and that endurance does come from testing it. If you've ever done any kind of physical training, if you've ever uh, been an athlete where you had to perform at some level, you know that the only way you're going to get endurance is practice. You know, if you play 
basketball or football or whatever, you can't just show up for the games. Even if you had the raw skill, you're not going to have the endurance, the stamina in order to endure all of that if that's the only time you're ever working out. It's just not going to happen. You have to practice, you have to train, you have to work through those difficulties and it's going to be difficult at some point. You're going to hit a point where you either have to keep going or back off. And sometimes backing off actually is the correct method in that particular instance. But the point is, you're going to have to build endurance through trials and difficulties in order to get to where you want to go, and faith is no different. You're going to have to endure trials of your faith in order to produce this endurance within you. So let's go ahead and look a little bit further in the book of James, where this is really more extrapolated in James 2, verses 14 through 17. What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? In the same way, faith also, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. So often, we see the world trying to keep faith and works apart. But James makes it pretty clear here that they cannot exist without each other. There is no such thing as a faith without works, and you may have occasionally works that are not motivated by faith on some level, but even then, they either they, they wouldn't count in your favor, for example, but more importantly, the only way that you're going to have truly good works is to have faith undergirding them. These two things are inextricably linked. They cannot exist one without the other. And James makes that fairly clear that that faith is not going to be able to save them. To go back to the example that we were giving earlier where, where Doug was talking about it affecting your behavior and then going back to Hebrews 1, I know it was a silly example, but it applies here. What are the odds that God saves Noah if he was like, yeah, God, I, I totally believe you're going to make it rain. I, I believe it. I believe that the world's going to flood and it stopped right there. Well, Noah would be drowning with everybody else and we wouldn't be here. Uh, the same could be true for any of the stories that we would go through. It wasn't just, I sincerely believe this, therefore I'm okay with God. It was, I believe what God has said and I act upon that belief. And so that's one of the things that James is trying to get at just like in the, the very literal sense that their faith saved them, in the spiritual sense, faith that has, is coupled with obedience and belief, uh, sorry, faith that is coupled with obedience and works are going to be what saves us as well because there is no faith apart from that. You know, I, I hate to bring this up, but it's very pertinent. The Respect for Marriage Act, which was just passed by the Senate this week, which essentially says that marriage is between two men, two women, a myriad of different definitions that could fit that. I think polygamy originally was in that, but they actually had to strike that out, which is a shame in a number of ways. Uh, the Senate actually passed that this week, and it essentially makes the case that we are going to protect religious people as long as they're in their church or they're an employee of a church in some way. But once they get outside the walls of that church, they're not Christians anymore. Once they get outside of that church, they're not allowed to, you know, say to a person, no, I don't think that the lifestyle that you are, uh, uh, that you are living out is okay. And so if that is something that is no longer able for a Christian, that comes from a place where people that wrote this law think essentially, well, you can be a Christian on Sundays for a couple of hours, and then you're not a Christian for the rest of your week, which to the people that wrote it probably makes sense because that's probably how they live their lives. But that's not the kind of faith that we're talking about in the scripture. It is a faith that permeates every aspect of who you are, and it assumes that you can hold your Christian values in some places but not in others. But that's not the picture that we see in the Bible because faith, if it has no works, is dead. You don't have faith if that is your faith. That is the point that James is making. 
a little bit further down the next few verses, James 2, 18 through 20. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to acknowledge, you foolish person, that faith without works is useless? So this is just a reiteration of the point that he just made, that faith without works is dead. He's saying, you can't just say, show me your faith without your works. That thing doesn't exist. Show me by your works that you do have faith. Show me the courage of your conviction. If you actually do believe in something, you are going to have action back that up. You know, again, I'm not saying that this is a model to be implemented or to, be, uh, to try to model your life after, but I was always bothered by the fact when people would talk about uh, Muslim terrorists and say that they're cowards. They're not cowards. There are a lot of things, evil, horrible, vile, have no respect for human life. All those things are true. They're not cowards. Because they do actually believe what they're saying. You don't kill yourself in the name of your faith if you don't actually believe it. Now, what they believe is a lie. What they believe is wrong. But the point is, they do actually believe in something. They have the courage of their conviction to act upon the faith that they have. And so if we're going to have a level of faith that the people in our church that founded it, you're talking about the apostles, you're talking about people like Stephen, who we know gave their own lives because they did believe in what they believed so deeply. We're going to have to do so knowing that our faith needs to be accompanied by action. And this is really uh, the difference in faith and belief, because it's saying right there in James, even the demons believe. Why is that not faith? Because their actions do not reflect that belief. They, look, the demons know God is real. They know God is real more than most of the people walking around on planet Earth today. They, they don't doubt God's existence. The reason they don't have faith is because they do not act appropriately in response to that knowledge. That's the difference in belief and faith. And then at the end of there, he's, he's saying that you understand that faith without works is useless. How does the knowledge that God exists benefit demons in any way? If anything, it just makes them more aware of the misery that they experience. And so if they do not have faith that alters their behavior, then we're going to be the same way. It's not enough to just believe in God. We have to actually act upon that. And we'll finish the, uh, the passage from James here uh, with verses 21 through 26. Was our father Abraham not justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected, and scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed in God, and it was credited to him to righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was Rahab the prostitute not justified by works also when she received the message and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So he's saying faith without works, that's the same thing as a body without a spirit. It's dead. It's not there anymore. It might as well not be. And it's interesting that the Greek word perfected that is used there also means brought to maturity or to completion. And so in other words, without the works, faith is not completed. You don't actually have a faith. It is the completing factor of faith. So notice how the Bible also constantly points to faithful people and it talks about what they did. And I'll get to my last point here where we'll, we'll bring up this conclusion. It always talks about what they did as opposed to just what they believed. So then the question becomes, what does it mean to actually believe? Do you teach the gospel? Do you stay away from sin? Do you meditate on the scripture daily? Do you long for the fellowship of Christ and his church? Do you give up things to obey the gospel? Because if we understand what you actually believe, what faith actually is, it is determined out of everything we've seen today, not by what you think is true, 
but whether or not you act on that belief. If you do not believe in something enough to actually react to it and have the appropriate reaction to it, that is not faith. So what it means to actually believe in God, believe in the Bible, believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, is that you live a life in response to that. That your faith is reflected in the decisions that you make and the things that you do. Ultimately, that's what we mean when we talk about faith. Thank you so much for your time and attention.